Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. Whomever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whoever is misguided cannot be guided except by Him. I bear witness and I testify that there is no God other than Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his final prophet and his most perfect worshipper. As to what follows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us to be conscious of him in the Quran when he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Dear Muslims, one of the most radical changes that is taking place in society around us in this very generation is the change of the family structure and even the types of changes in the family structure are different but one of the most obvious is the very stability of the family one generation ago in this country in 1960s more than 95 percent of children were born to a married couple that's the way it should be that's the way intended by allah that is nature 95 percent of children were born to a married couple this is one generation ago do you know what that statistic is now almost half of children born today are born outside of wedlock let that statistic stink sink in we are literally destroying the family in one generation. One generation ago, 95% of children are born to two parents, wed together, hopefully in love together, wanting to establish a life together. And today, one generation, 1960s is not that many of you were young in 1960s. It's one generation ago. And today, almost half, perhaps in a few years it will be half, of all children are born to people that are not married. And this is in America. As for Europe and other places, it is already more than half. And we are still studying the impact of what happens when children are raised without two parents, without a solid family, without a stable background. And almost every single psychological sociological survey and research that has been done almost every single research done interdisciplinary realities demonstrates that a solid intact family a loving family a mother and father figure have significant positive impacts on the development of the child on the future well-being of the child a family offers countless benefits for both adults and for children. On average, on average, children raised in stable households perform better on every single measurable scale known to man. I repeat, if you look at all the surveys and statistics done in every field, on average we find, and this is common sense, you don't need statistics to prove this, on average we find children born and raised in stable households perform better on every single measurable scale. Emotional, intellectual development, educational, social, motor skills, functioning in society, giving back to society, graduating, getting stable jobs, having families of their own, having better lives of their own, and we go on and on and on. Children raised in loving households, by and large, are less prone to commit acts of violence, less prone to turn to a life of evil, less prone to end up in jail, and overall, far more statistically shown to become productive members of society. In other words, successful parents, surprise, surprise, usually produce successful children. That is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal, and it is the proven reality of the world around us. And by the way, these studies don't bring in religion. They're not coming from Muslims. They're not bringing in Quran and Sunnah. These are sociological, psychological surveys and studies done across generations 
to indicate a fact that, wallahi, we don't need any survey to prove. Our fitra tells us this. A child born to loving parents, a child raised in a stable household, overall will be a better child, a safer child, a more intellectual child, a more stable person, a person who will give back to society. And this is why, brothers and sisters, the sharia has come with one of the fundamental goals being to preserve the family, to protect the family, to keep the bonds of marriage. And subhanallah, once we open the door for religion, once we start studying religion, we also find, and this is again surveys done by people not themselves religious, surveys done in the modern academy, go look up any science journal, any research paper. The number one cause of protecting the faith in the next generation has nothing to do with the quality of the Sunday school. It has nothing to do with the rise and fall of the faith outside of, you know, uh, the bonds of social media. No, the number one mechanism to preserve the faith in the next generation across all faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, the number one mechanism is to have a stable family that is bonding because of the faith and through the faith. Again, these are surveys done by people who don't care about religion. They're simply documenting. They're telling us like it is. When Christian families that love one another raise Christian children, by and large those children end up Christian. When Buddhist families, when Muslim families, these are surveys done. You want to protect your children. Have families based upon your religious identity. Come together as loving families with your religious identity as, as a center stage. And lo and behold, the number one cause of the next generation protecting the faith following the faith observing the faith is they had successful role model parents who are observing the faith and again should not be any surprise to us but sometimes we need to quote these statistics sometimes we need to tell you of these realities to jolt us awake into reality and that reality is a simple fact that should be known to all brothers and sisters in this time and place we live in when everything is going chaotic when right is becoming left and up is becoming down and morality is becoming immorality what is the number one mechanism to preserve our sanity and the sanity of our children what is the number one mechanism to give them a chance to be successful in this dunya and in the akhirah the number one mechanism psychologically sociologically the fitra is to have a successful family you and your spouse you come together based upon this religion with the teachings of islam and you become a role model mother and father you live your lives around the faith through the faith by the faith you live your lives of love and compassion and automatically your children will absorb those values. Your children will be more mentally mature, will be more emotionally capable, will have a higher percentage of becoming socially productive and avoiding the wrong paths here and there. In other words, deen and dunya is both preserved when we preserve the family. And therefore, brothers and sisters, again, this is a reminder because how many khutbas have been given, but it doesn't change the reality that unfortunately we are seeing. And that is the reality of the breakdown of our own families within our own communities. Every week, every few days, another case comes to us, comes to me, and we hear of another divorce, another reality, another breakdown. So it is imperative that we remind ourselves over and over again, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Dear Muslims, the marriage contract between you and your spouse. It is not like any other business contract. It is not a trivial contract. It is the most sacred contract you can ever sign. There is no contract that is more sacred and more blessed than this contract. It's not like any other contract. Yes, at one level it is a contract, but it is a contract like no other. The nikah contract is the most sacred contract in our sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it mithaqan ghalidha. It is a sacred covenant. وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْهُنَّ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Allah calls the covenant of marriage a strict covenant, a sacred covenant. And in the khutbatul wada' the final khutbah that our Prophet gave, the last time he spoke to a large audience, that khutbah had five paragraphs. He had to choose five things that he wanted to leave his ummah with. He had to choose 
five talking points. And number four of that talking point was about the family. One of the five final talking points of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was about the family and about the marriage contract. And he reminded, of course, he's speaking to men because that was the way, the way he's speaking to men. But when you speak to any gender, the other gender is included. He said to men that, oh men, be mindful of this contract. He mentioned the marriage contract. Be mindful of the contract, that sacred covenant that allows you to have intimacy, that allows you to do what is otherwise not allowed. And he said in that khutbah, he said, you use the name of Allah. You invoke Allah Azza wa Jal and you made otherwise what would be haram. This is intimacy. You made it halal and you came together in a special union and you mention and invoke the name of Allah. So be mindful of that contract contract be mindful of your spouses in other words the prophet is telling us preserve the family protect the bonds of marriage be mindful and conscious of the rights and responsibilities each spouse has on the other again brothers and sisters i gave a khutbah two three weeks ago about the goals of the sharia and we said one of the primary goals of the sharia one of the fundamental goals of the sharia is to protect the bonds of marriage, to protect the sanctity of the family. We all know in that hadith that the Rasul told us that the, the shaitan, who, that all the shayateen go and give waswasa whisperings and they go back to Iblis himself and they will say to Iblis, oh, I caused this young man to gamble. I caused this young lady to do this sin and he will keep on dismissing until finally when one shaitan comes and tells Iblis, oh, I kept on pestering one couple and making their arguments worse until I caused them to divorce. The Prophet said, Iblis will stand up from his throne and hug this shaitan and say, you have accomplished something today. In other words, when a divorce takes place without due cause, again that underline, sometimes a divorce is with due cause and that's not because of shaitan. But when shaitan causes a divorce, when shaitan makes a small thing bigger and they shouldn't have divorced but misunderstanding, arrogance, kibir comes in, grudges come in. When shaitan causes a divorce, Iblis himself hugs that shaitan. Iblis says, you have accomplished something today. In other words, protecting marriage pleases Allah by displeasing Iblis. Protecting marriage is an act of worship because we're fighting shaitan. And when we allow marriage to crumble, when we allow a small issue to become bigger, when we allow a divorce to take, take place without just cause, we are making the enemy of Allah happy because that enemy understands the destruction of marriage is the destruction of society. The destruction of marriage will bring about the destruction of society. Therefore, brothers and sisters, some brief advice to myself and all of you. Generic advice based on the Quran and Sunnah and based on the lived realities of uh, marital uh, advice that has been culled from many centuries of marital experience. The first advice I give myself and all of you. The first advice I give myself and all of you. Before you jump to the faults of your spouse, before you concentrate on the negatives, pause and force yourself to keep in mind the positives. Because it is human nature that we jump over the positive. It is human nature. We take the good for granted and we jump to the negatives. It is not appropriate when you assess somebody that you only look at their negatives. Wallahi, a court of law, any judge, any exam, when you hand in the paper, yes, you're taken off for the negative, but how about the right questions? How about the right answers? How about the good responses? You weigh everything. On Qiyamah, what's going to happen? Will Allah only look at your negatives? No, you will look at all the positives. And even if you have some negatives, but the positives are much more, inshallah, we will pass. If we will pass because of this, how about your spouse? How about your life partner? So weigh the positives before you jump to the negatives. In fact, this advice, it is not coming from me. It is coming from our Prophet ﷺ. In a famous hadith, he said, talking about couples, talking about husbands and wives, he said, let no mu'min, a believing man, despise a mu'min, a believing woman, meaning his wife. Let no husband or wife hate his or her wife in totality. Let your heart not be full of evil and animosity and anger. Then he said, if you happen to dislike one characteristic, for sure you will like some characteristic as well. In other words, he's teaching us basic psychology, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you don't like one thing, don't concentrate on that negative. Take a step back, ask yourself, 
what are the positives of my life partner? Perhaps, perhaps your partner has a sharp tongue. That's a problem. But maybe they're also loving to the children. Maybe they're able to uh, manage finances well. Maybe they're a good leader in other aspects. So take advantage of that and look at the negative in light of the positive. Nobody is just a bunch of negatives. Every person has some good and some bad. So before you concentrate on the negatives, look at the positives as well and force yourself to take a, a part of the broader picture and assess the positives. Before you get angry at the negative, ask yourself what are the positives, then thank Allah. Alhamdulillah, my spouse has such and such positive. Point number two, the Quran advises us as well in this regard and the sunnah in this regard as well. Point number two, do not hold petty grudges. Do not keep in your heart negativity based upon some small stuff. Forgive as much as possible. Overlook as much as possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, in Surah at taghabun again about spouses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a verse that requires an entire khutbah, but we'll summarize it. Allah says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, O you who believe, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduwa lakum. Some of your spouses and some of your children, they are your enemies. Now this has generated a lot of discussion. What do you mean my spouse and child is my enemy? And the scholars say, listen to this, the meaning of this is not that your spouse and your children want to harm you. It's not that your spouse and your children will drag you down because of who they are. It is that chances are you will fail in your obligation towards them. And you will be your own worst enemy in your treatment of them. You will not be able to do justice. And so, in order to be a good father or a good husband and you fail, it is as if the cause of your downfall became your spouse and your children. Not that they brought your downfall, but you fail to live up to your responsibilities. So Allah says, فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be conscious, be careful. Be careful because one of the main causes of failure is failure in marital life. One of the main causes of failure is failure as a parent. So Allah is saying, be careful. Because one, not the only, but one of the causes of your failure might be your own spouse, might be your own child. So be careful. فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Then Allah gives us a simple tactic. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah tells us to deal with our own inner rage, inner anger. One of the easiest mechanisms, stop holding grudges for the petty stuff. Because what happens when you have a grudge, when you keep the petty stuff in your heart, is that you overreact. You overcompensate. Rather than doing something trivial and rebuking, in your anger, in your rage, you will become the zalim. You will become the tyrant. So Allah says, وَإِن تَعْفُوا And if you were to erase from your heart that negativity, وَتَصْفَحُوا Turn over and you leave. Give them another chance. تَصْفَحُوا Literally, you, you, you turn the page. Like, give them another chance. Let the past be the past. Let bygones be bygones. Don't hold it in your heart. وَتَغْفِرُوا And forgive your wife, forgive your children. Let it go on, let it go. Don't hold it in your heart. The Qur'an is telling you, be careful. Your spouse and your children will be the cause of your downfall. Then Allah says, but you can save yourself. How? By having a clean heart. Forgiving, don't hold grudges. Give them another chance. تَغْفِرُوا Forgive your own children. Forgive your own spouse. This is one of the strongest mechanisms to protect yourself against yourself and the excesses of your own family and children. This is a beautiful and powerful verse that teaches us that family and children are a test and trial. And one of the easiest ways to overcome that test and trial is not to concentrate on them, but to concentrate on me, to concentrate on ourselves, to let our hearts not fret over the small stuff, not become bogged down by every single petty issue. Let something of yesterday be yesterday. Life goes on. You have a future with this, with this woman, with this wife, with this mother of your children. You have another 20, 30, 40 years. Why are you going to hold this small argument yesterday and cause it to lead to something much bigger? وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا تَعْفُوا is the highest. Eliminate. If you can't do that, تَصْفَحُوا Give them another chance. Turn it over. Let it be in the past. And always وَتَعْفُوا 
astaghfiru, forgive, forgive, forgive. Not for the sake of your ego, not even for the sake of your spouse, for the sake of Allah, and also for the sake of your children, for the sake of marriage. You need to maintain your marital happiness, not just for your happiness, but to, for the happiness of your children and for the happiness of the entire society around you. This is the second advice that the Quran gives us. And then the third and final one, because time is limited, the third and final one, brothers and sisters, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives through somebody's kindness what will not be given through someone's harshness. You will get through love what you will not get through harshness and anger. This is a generic hadith. Allah gives what you want. Allah gives it when you're kind. Allah gives it when you're compassionate. Allah gives it when you're loving. Allah gives through kindness what you will not give through what you will not get through harshness meaning what rather than use harshness and anger rather than raise your voice rather than threaten this is one of the biggest mistakes that a couple makes against each other to threaten and to take things nasty and to invoke you know astaghfirullah allah's anger or the sharia has made it obligatory to obey me my dear husbands yes it is obligatory obedience but do you think by shouting your wife will genuinely respect you do you think by raising your voice and invoking that is how you will attain the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the way leave it to me and leave it to other third parties to remind both gen Yes, you have to fear Allah. Yes, you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, women must respect their husbands. Yes, husbands should fulfill the rights of their wives. Leave it to a third party. But when you're having a dispute with your wife and you raise your voice and you bring in astaghfirullah, Allah's la'na, you bring in, you'd better do this or else. Marriage is based upon love, not fear. Marriage is based upon kindness, not anger. Marriage is based upon compassion, not hatred. So this is not the best tactic between each other. True, somebody has to do it and leave it to me and other people to remind all of us, myself and all of you, that yes, there should be a fear of Allah in both of your hearts. There should be a accountability in both of your hearts. But laterally, between each other, the primary relationship is love. The primary relationship is compassion. So use the language of love to solve as many problems as as possible brothers and sisters much can be said but you know what in the end of the day there is no rule book that guarantees a successful marriage there is no set of guidelines there is no algebraic equations that if this is the problem you turn to this equation it will solve it no there's no simplistic solution to the problems of marriage and every one of us has a different set of problems because we're different people and our spouses are different people so all we can advise one another. Number one, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that Allah wants your marriage to be successful. And number two, marriages are based on love and compassion. Marriages are based upon kindness. Marriages are based upon that feeling of genuinely wanting to benefit your spouse. Both parties, if they come together with that attitude, inshallah ta'ala, the marriage will work and they should do so not just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also for the sake of their children. Marriages, dear brothers and sisters, are Allah's biggest blessings to us as a human species after religious blessings. The biggest blessing Allah has given us after the religious blessings, خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا He has created for us spouses so that we can find comfort. Protect your marriages, guard your marriages, work on your marriages, and Allah Azza wa Jal will show you the fruits of that work in this dunya before the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran, and may He make us of those who is verses they understand, and applies halal and haram through our lifespan. Ask Allah's forgiveness you as well ask him for his the ghafoor and the rahman Alhamdulillah al wahid al ahad al samad alladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad wa ba'du Brothers and sisters every time we talk about marriage we must always bring up the awkward reality of divorce there is no doubt that it is something that needs to be discussed in more detail. But realize divorce is always a last option. Divorce is there like a fire exit when there's no other escape then. And the Sharia has provided guidelines and I have given multiple khutbas about this. And please 
Listen to those khutbas by me and by other scholars out there. Learn the etiquette of divorce before you need it. Understand the fiqh of divorce before you have to resort to it. Know this background knowledge before you need to know. Just like when you board the plane, they tell you the fire escape. You hopefully never need to know, but you had better know before you need to do it. Because if you don't know and there's a fire, well, Allah and Mustan, you're going to be in big trouble. Similarly with divorce, you need to know the rules. Know the etiquette before you need to. All too often, people fall into major mistakes because they've never studied divorce. And then they come to the Shaykh, the Imam, the Mufti, Shaykh, I did this, Shaykh, I did that. Well, you messed up and you didn't know you messed up. You need to learn before you come to any Shaykh in this regard. So I advise all of you, when things are good, no problem still, you should know this stuff because this is an emergency escape that should only be availed to when there is a need to do so. Yes, sometimes divorce is the better option. When there is abuse, when there is abandonment, when there is total incompatibility and the proper steps are followed, well then, it is what it is. And some of the greatest Sahaba as well divorced and they were still the greatest Sahaba uh, despite that divorce. A divorce does not mean you're a bad person. And sometimes it is better for your Iman, for your health, for your sanity to end the marriage. And also, if a marriage is ended or if one of you is in a single parent situation, Please, sisters and brothers, especially single mothers, don't pay attention to those statistics then because statistics mean nothing at an individual level. Wallahi, dear sisters that are raising children on their own, I swear to you, I am always in awe of the courage and sacrifices of single mothers. I'm always in awe about how much challenges you have, about how you're taking on the world, how you're doing more than any man could possibly do if he was in your situation. It is a miracle from Allah, single mother they become simultaneously more than just uh, any other lady can become. They become a father figure, a mother figure. So if you're in that situation, dear single mother, forget those statistics. You will inshallah ta'ala be successful with your children. These statistics mean nothing at the individual level. And yes, of course, try to find a partner. That is good. But if not, then inshallah it is what it is. And for wisdom known to Allah, Allah has decided to test you in a way that inshallah you will also see this reality. Don't lose hope. Don't lose heart and realize some of the greatest people in our history were raised by single mothers. Isa was raised by a single mother. He was of the mightiest prophets. Imam al-Bukhari was raised by a single mother and he became who he became. So don't lose hope and don't worry about these statistics. You do your job. You do you. You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make lots of dua and inshallah ta'ala your children will be even more successful than the average children out there. No worries. Inshallah ta'ala. But yes, as a default, we try to keep our marriages and keep the children within a stable marriage. The final conclusion, brothers and sisters, even if society around us is heading towards complete chaos. Even if more than 50% of children in broader society are born outside of marriage, we as a Muslim minority have to be role model citizens and role model worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to show broader society what it means to be a worshipper of Allah on morality, on Abrahamic religion, what it means to have a successful marriage, what it means to raise children in the normal manner. And this is one of the strongest mechanisms of da'wah and it is also the strongest mechanism to preserve Islam for many generations to come. Barakallahi wa rakum fi Qur'an azim. Allahumma ni da'in fa aminu. Allahumma la ta'da'in fi hal yawmi thamman illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la daynan illa qadayta. Wa la maridan illa shafayta. Wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li ikhwanin alladhin sabakuna bin iman. Wa la taj'a fi qulubina ghillan lilladhina amanu. Rabbana inna karaufur rahim. Allahumma a'izz al-islam wa al-muslimin. Allahumma man aradana wa arad al-islam wa al-muslimin bisun فاجغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمن من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك رسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم اذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي 
أما استحييت تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب Thank you.